This video brought to you by Shopify. Who do you feel that you owe along the way? Oh my goodness. Um, I owe everybody who ever had a dream and saw it through, uh, no matter who told them they couldn't do it. In 1978, Wendy and Richard Peeney brought their idea for a new comic book called ElfQuest to Marvel Comics. Like the Peenies themselves, ElfQuest was kind of quirky, a little odd, and Marvel practically laughed them out of the building. They got the same response from DC. ElfQuest was already dead. See, at this time, Marvel and DC had a stranglehold on the comic market. If you wanted to work in comics, you went to work for them. Wendy and Richard should have given up, given in, but they were stubborn. Picking a fight with the Peenies would turn out to be one of the biggest mistakes these two companies ever made. Because these two industry outsiders were so determined to see ElfQuest in print that they would inadvertently destroy Marvel and DC's chokehold on the industry, helping start a creator-owned revolution that is still continuing to this day. But as much as this is a story of success, it's also the story of the great personal toll that that kind of fight can take on someone, or in this case, on a married couple. But before we get to all that, we need to understand why this mattered so much to them, why they're willing to risk everything to tell their story their way. Where do you go to feel like you belong, to feel accepted for who you are? I ask because this story starts in 1968 with a boy and a girl who were looking for that acceptance, and they were looking in the one place that made the most sense, the letters page of Marvel Comics. It's easy to forget how important letters pages were back then. This was way before the internet, way before comic shops existed. If you loved comics and you didn't live in a big city, pretty much the only way to connect with other fans was through the letters page. One of those letter writers was Richard Peeney, a shy, isolated MIT astrophysics student who had fallen in love with Marvel Comics. And he was struck by a letter that appeared in Silver Surfer number five. It was smart, it was thoughtful, and it was written by a girl. Her name was Wendy and Richard wrote her a letter. He waited and waited for a response and finally a letter arrived. Not just a letter, but a letter with a drawing. Richard thought it was the most incredible drawing he'd ever seen. Whether he knew it or not, Wendy's art was about to change his life. They became pen pals, and over the next four years, Richard would learn the incredible story of Wendy's childhood. Well, ElfQuest is a story that's been with me since I was a child. It's very autobiographical, believe it or not. Wendy's life sometimes seems like something out of a stereotypical fantasy novel. See, Wendy was born with a gift, but Wendy was adopted by a family who misunderstood and resented her for that gift. Wendy's gift was her ability to draw, and at times it really does seem like magic. Here is a drawing she did at only two years old. As you look through other drawings from her childhood, you can see just how talented she was. But as you can probably also tell, these drawings weren't preserved. Look closer and you realize that these drawings weren't even done on drawing paper, but on rolls of paper towels. Wendy's father was a bullying alcoholic and Wendy's mother resented her drawing ability and would physically drag Wendy away from her drawing board. Wendy dreamed of one day finding her biological family, a family who would appreciate her talents. But that wasn't to be the case in the small town of Gilroy, California, so Wendy would escape into the world of cartoons. This was the golden age of cartoon animation, and Wendy was obsessed with Johnny Quest, Looney Tunes, and Disney. But Wendy's mother hated cartoons and would punish Wendy by taking them away. But this had a surprising effect because Wendy would try and capture those cartoons in her own drawings, basically inventing her own version of a comic book out of sheer necessity. Eventually, her grandmother noticed her gifts and encouraged Wendy by giving her books of the great classic illustrators. These would help shape and direct her art, but soon she would discover her greatest influence of all, anime. Now this was well before that term came into existence, but at 10 years old, Wendy saw Osamu Tezuka's Alakazam the Great and knew she had seen something special. Here was a cartoon like the ones she loved, but it was serious, it was spiritual. In her own words, she became America's first otaku. She watched Alakazam over and over, and after it left theaters, would capture it in her drawings, eventually expanding its story with her own imagination. She was, through her art and her storytelling, creating a family of her own, the family who would approve of her, the one she didn't have in real life. I think the most important thing I did for myself in that family was to say to myself, I cannot be as bad or as foolish or as misguided as they're telling me I am. And it was around this time that she discovered the final piece in her artistic puzzle, Marvel Comics. She had never been interested in superheroes, but the Fantastic Four wasn't the story of superhumans, but of a family, and a dysfunctional family at that. 
Like Tezuka, it showed her that these so-called children's mediums could be serious and meaningful, could help people through life's darkest moments. And it wasn't just Marvel's stories that intrigued Wendy. It was the art. Jack Kirby had taken the classic heroic drawing styles of Hal Foster and Alex Raymond and infused it with a dynamism, a sense of weight, and an intensity of motion that was like nothing Wendy had ever seen. She absorbed Kirby's style into her own style, blending it with her anime and classical influences into something that was wholly original, a merging of Eastern and Western styles that would help her stand out, but would also prove to be one of her biggest barriers to mainstream acceptance. And, in addition to becoming a regular Marvel letter writer, she began connecting with other fans through the mail, publishing her art in amateur fanzines. She escaped her family and got to college, and finally began finding a family in fandom that she never had at home. And then one day, her pen pal Richard showed up in her dorm room. He had driven 3,000 miles to meet her in person. And here was Richard, someone who not only accepted Wendy for who she was, but who believed in her abilities with every ounce of his being, who was ready to dedicate his life to helping the world see how wonderful she was. A few months later, they were married. At this time, Wendy was determined to work in animation, to make the kind of cartoons that had helped her get through her childhood, and Richard was there to support her. But somewhere deeper inside, there was a story Wendy wanted to tell, a story that had been with her since her childhood, a story that would come to change the entire comic book landscape, but one she wasn't ready to share with anyone yet, not even Richard. For now, Wendy and Richard would look for acceptance by getting deeper into the emerging world of fandom. It's called a comic book convention, all right, but it's a lot more than that. See, while the idea of conventions, whether for science fiction, fantasy, or comic books, had been around for a while, they were really ramping up in the late 60s and early 70s. I can only imagine how Wendy and Richard must have felt, after years of isolation, of only finding other fans through the mail, to finally be in a room with dozens of other people who shared their interests. It was through these conventions that Wendy got her art noticed, and she became a professional illustrator with her work regularly being published in real magazines. But it would be at one such convention that Wendy took on the role that would both shape her career going forward, as well as haunt her for the rest of her life. See, in 1973, an unlikely comic character had become a huge hit. Her name was Red Sonia. She appeared in the pages of Conan the Barbarian, and the tough female warrior in the chainmail bikini became instantly popular. She was quickly given her own series, drawn by the very talented, very eccentric artist Frank Thorne. Calling Thorne eccentric might be an understatement. He would travel to various conventions dressed up as a wizard and judge Red Sonia lookalike contests. It was at one of these conventions that he met Wendy and suggested that she enter the contest. Here was a chance for Wendy to find a role for herself in her new found family. And as always, Richard was there to support her. Together they went about creating the chainmail bikini that Wendy would wear at Thorne's next contest. Not only did she win that contest, but she became THE Red Sonia for Frank Thorne and an important pioneer in the field of cosplay. Together they developed a stage show called Red Sonia and the Wizard and they would tour from comic convention to comic convention and eventually she even got to appear on on national TV as Red Sonia. Here she was becoming accepted and appreciated in her found family, as she never had in her own family, but it wasn't always in the way she had hoped. She knew she was more than just a cosplayer. She was more than just an artist. She was a storyteller. In developing the stage show, Thorne had noticed this and had helped her get a job writing an issue of Red Sonia. Now she was a professional comic writer. She showed a lot of talent and could easily have continued down that path, but she didn't want to write comics. She didn't want to write other people's characters. A story still burned inside her. One that she believed in, but one that she had always kept to herself. But then, in 1977, something happened that made her think the world might just be ready for ElfQuest. Suddenly, the biggest movie in the world was made by a comic geek. Fantasy and sci-fi were going mainstream. Wendy was finally ready to tell Richard the story she had been working on since her childhood. It was the story of a band of elves who live in a world of humans who hate and fear them, but who go on a grand quest to find others who are like them. Richard was entranced. He was convinced that this story needed to be told and was once again ready to devote his life to facilitate Wendy telling it. The question was, what form would it take? Wendy's dream, of course, was to see ElfQuest animated, but to succeed, it would need to be a mature, serious 30-hour animation and nothing on that scale had ever been done before. That same year, in 77, Ralph Bakshi's Wizards had come out, showing what serious fantasy animation could look like, but that was still a far cry from what Wendy dreamed of for ElfQuest. No, despite both their reservations, the thing that made the most sense was to make a comic book. So Wendy and Richard got to work. Together, over pizza and on long drives, they plotted the story out, building up the world and the characters. But just as they were gaining momentum, they hit their first big snag. 
On a whim, Wendy had sent some of her art to Ralph Bakshi, the director of Wizards. He was so impressed by what he saw that he offered her a job to come work on his next project, an animated adaptation of Lord of the Rings. This was a chance to fulfill her dream of working in animation, but it meant leaving ElfQuest behind, leaving Richard behind. But she had to pursue it, so she moved to Hollywood to work with Bakshi. But after only two weeks, she realized she had made a mistake. Animation may have been her dream once, but ElfQuest had become more important to her. So she came home, and she and Richard finished the presentation of ElfQuest. I want to be very clear. At this point, they had no interest in self-publishing, no intention of going into the publishing business. They did the logical thing and brought ElfQuest to the people they knew at Marvel. But Wendy was one of only a few Americans who had ever bothered to read imported manga, and no one at Marvel had any idea what to make of her big-eyed, expressive characters and this quirky, unique story she created. They rejected them outright, and they got the same response at DC. At this point, again, I'm shocked that the Peenies kept going. Like so many people, they could have filed their dream away, worked on established characters, and hoped that one day a chance would come to tell their story. But ElfQuest was too important to them, and that determination, that stubbornness, was about to turn the comic industry on its head. Now, before we can understand how the Peenies would upend the comic industry, we need to understand the state of that industry in 1977, because it was undergoing a radical transformation. If you want the full history, I really recommend the book Comic Shop by Dan Giorino, but I'll summarize a portion of that book here. See, as late as the early 70s, the modern idea of a comic shop didn't really exist. Comics had always been sold at newsstands, at grocery stores, at convenience stores, anywhere you'd pick up a newspaper or magazine. And just like those other periodicals, the distributors just sent their own selection of comics to the store, and whatever they didn't sell could be returned to the distributor for a refund. Like newspapers and magazines, comics were considered cheap and disposable, to be read once and thrown away. But by the late 60s and early 70s, that perception was changing. People had begun to realize the value of older issues. Yeah, comic book increase in price. They do. About 20% a year. And so some bookstores and private collectors began holding on to or buying older issues to resell them later at a higher price. This was one of the early appeals to comic conventions, buying, selling, and trading back issues. One of the largest convention organizers at this time was Phil Suling, and when he saw this trend, he saw it as a big business opportunity. Suling figured that some stores would want to buy comics on a non-returnable basis. He made deals with Marvel and DC and offered these stores a lower cost per comic, but they wouldn't be able to return them, and they'd be stuck with any inventory that didn't sell. This model came to be called the direct market. This innovation was a hit. Beyond just bookstores, dedicated comic shops opened up, building up their inventory by buying from Suling and other similar distributors. While 90% of comic distribution still went to the newsstands, these shops were havens for hardcore comic fans, the dedicated readers who weren't satisfied to just grab whatever was on the spinner rack that week. But soon, this non-returnable business model had another impact. While the underground comics of the 60s, a great topic for another video, had relied on head shops and record stores to reach buyers, this new direct market model meant that small, independent publishers could get their comics into stores without the risk of being crushed by refunds. They might only sell a few hundred copies, but they finally had a way to reach the dedicated, hardcore comic buyer. So Wendy and Richard took ElfQuest to these newly established publishers, but they passed on them as well. It seemed once again that ElfQuest was dead. But then, at a convention, Richard met a guy who claimed to be an independent comic publisher. Richard showed him the pitch for ElfQuest, and the guy agreed to publish it, telling Richard his plans to print it in full color on high-quality paper. Finally, someone had said yes to ElfQuest. After the convention, they sent the original art to ElfQuest number 1 to him in Detroit so he could have it colored and begin printing. They waited and waited for it to come out as they finished work on issue number 2. They sent in the art for issue number 2, and finally, Fantasy Quarterly number 1 came out. It was a mess. Not only was it not in color, the whole thing was printed on the cheapest paper stock possible. Even the cover was thin and flimsy, and the colors were all wrong. On top of that, they hadn't been paid a dime. This had been months of their work, of their time. They had been funding this project with Richard's day job and the money Wendy got selling art at conventions and winning belly dancing competitions. They could not afford not to be paid. The publication date for issue two came and went, and nothing came out. Richard was writing and calling the publisher, but getting no response. Some Something was clearly wrong. This is yet another point where normal rational people might give up. But Wendy and Richard Peeney are not normal rational people. With the little money they had left, Richard bought a plane ticket to Detroit. He arrived early and sat on the sidewalk outside the publisher's office until he arrived. The publisher was quite surprised to see Richard there, and after a nice friendly chat, Richard was on a plane home from Detroit. He didn't get their money, but he did get the original art to ElfQuest back. Richard finally realized the only way the world was going to see ElfQuest was if they published it themselves. 
because while that experience should have scared them away, should have showed them just how difficult comic publishing could be, should have made them give up on ElfQuest, it also showed them something else. It showed them that they were onto something. Because ElfQuest number one, despite all of its flaws, had been a success, selling 10,000 copies. And so, Warp Graphics was born. As Wendy continued handling scripting, penciling, inking, and lettering entirely by herself, Richard, while still holding on to his day job, taught himself how to become a comic publisher. He opened up the yellow pages and looked up printers, bringing them copies of Star Reach and First Kingdom to show them what he envisioned. He eventually found one printer who could do the interiors and another who could do the covers. He figured out how to put together ads, a subscription offering, and of course, a letters page. They had gone all in on ElfQuest. Now they just needed to find a distributor, but now their adopted family would rally around them. Remember this guy who brought Wendy on that talk show? That's Phil Suling, inventor of direct market distribution. He and Wendy had become friends through the convention scene. He knew she was a talented illustrator and he believed in her. So Suling pooled his money with another distributor, Bud Plant, and together they bought 20,000 copies of ElfQuest No. 2 to begin distributing exclusively in comic shops. And arguably no comic was better suited to the new direct market than ElfQuest. It is this big continuing story meant to be collected and read in order. And Wendy and Richard specifically produced each issue not as a disposable periodical, but as a work of art. They were magazine sized with painted front covers and painted pinups on the back filled inside with Wendy's beautiful black and white line work printed on good quality paper. And because they had no marketing budget, they relied on the kind of word of mouth that only existed in comic shops. So as shop owners told customers, as customers told each other, the ElfQuest fire started to burn. All 20,000 issues sold out. Four months later, when they published issue three, Suling and Plant doubled their order to 40,000 copies. From their home, the Peenies, entirely by themselves, had just launched the biggest independent comic to ever be published. The other big independent of this era, Cerebus by Dave Sim, had launched a few months earlier, but it would never hit the same sales heights as ElfQuest. Things were just beginning to heat up for Wendy and Richard. The rocket ship of ElfQuest was taking off and was about to change their lives dramatically for both better and worse. But before we get back to that and the effect ElfQuest would have on comic publishing as a whole, let's actually take a look inside these early issues and try and understand just what made it so popular. I think there are four key reasons that ElfQuest really stood out. The first, before we even talk about the art and story, is its place in the history of fantasy, specifically this kind of epic fantasy. While Lord of the Rings had been published over 20 years earlier, the boom of Tolkien-inspired fantasy was really just beginning. A Wizard of Earthsea had been published in 1968, and in 1977, around the same time as ElfQuest, there were a number of other Tolkien-inspired works coming out, but this was still well before the 80s and 90s fantasy boom. So fans of fantasy, especially big, complex, epic fantasy, really had never seen anything on ElfQuest scale, especially not in the comic medium. ElfQuest was breaking through and reaching fantasy readers in a way that hardcore comic fans would come to resent, but we'll get back to that. Next up, and perhaps most obviously, is Wendy's art. ElfQuest is not only stunning, but absolutely unique. Again, remember this is 1978. Most of ElfQuest readers would have never seen manga before, let alone art that looked like Wendy's. She takes the big-eyed, three-fingered, expressive characters from Tezuka, but gives them the weight, muscle, and dynamics of a Jack Kirby drawing. Then she drops them into a fantastic world inspired by those classic illustrators her grandmother had introduced her to. There's so much going on on every page that it's just a joy to pour over. But you can see why Marvel or DC, who were used to art looking like this, didn't know what to make of ElfQuest at the time. But it connected with fans specifically because it was so new and exciting, and honestly, it still feels fresh and unique today. But all of that artistic innovation wouldn't matter at all if it wasn't in service of a story that was meaningful. But every time I sit down with ElfQuest, I find myself hooked once again after only a few pages. It's this grand adventure that is paced absolutely perfectly. It just rips along from set piece to set piece, easily switching from big battles to dramatic romance. And through it all, the characters are the main focus. Wendy's use of manga-inspired facial expressions and dramatic body language makes it easy to get to know each of the huge cast of characters. There's Cutter, the hot-blooded elf who lives in a world where he is hated for who he is, but is determined to find others like him. He is balanced by his best friend Skywise, the astronomer elf who believes in Cutter and supports his dream, and who helps him cool his passions and direct his energy. Are you sensing that this story might be a touch autobiographical? This, I think, is the real key to ElfQuest's success. In its own way, it's as personal as something like American Splendor or Binky Brown. Through metaphor, Wendy and Richard put their whole lives in the open, and I feel like that gives ElfQuest a richness that sets it apart from so many other similar stories. 
This is a story about feeling ostracized, feeling misunderstood, feeling hated because you are different. But it's equally the story of the joy of finding others like you, of falling in love with someone who accepts you for who you are. It doesn't deal in labels, but speaks strongly to anyone who feels different or ostracized. It feels like a message from Wendy to her younger self, because despite all the action and violence, reading ElfQuest is like getting a big warm hug, like someone telling you it's okay to be who you are. I grew up with the absolute contrast to acceptance. There was racial prejudice, there was judgmentalism, there was criticism. Growing up in that and knowing that is not for me, that doesn't feel right, and I'm not going to go in that direction. I just thought, what if there were beings in the world who simply wanted to live their lives not as heroes, not as telling other people how to live or what was moral, but simply wanted to live their lives treating others the best they could. It probably comes as no surprise that ElfQuest spread quickly by word of mouth and found a dedicated group of fans who fell deeply in love with it. And Richard, instead of trying to drive up back issue prices, worked tirelessly to keep every issue in print. This wasn't a popular decision with many collectors and retailers, but that wasn't the point. His mission was to make sure ElfQuest was read by as many people as possible. And so, with each issue, with each reprint, readership grew. Grew to the point where it was selling as much as the top Marvel and DC books. This was all more than the peenies had expected. They thought ElfQuest would be a hobby, that it might make enough money to break even. Richard had a lucrative career at IBM, which gave them the confidence to pursue it, but between his publishing responsibilities and his day job, he was barely sleeping. He knew it was probably time to quit, but still, he had never set out to be a comic publisher. His original mission was just to facilitate his wife's vision, but he was being torn in half. He worried that if he left his job, things might still go south with ElfQuest. They could end up losing their house. But after wrestling with the decision for six months, Richard finally quit his job and became a full-time comic publisher. Despite his inexperience, he quickly began exploring all of the opportunities that were coming their way. In a short period, he was signing deals and making pitches for an ElfQuest VHS, ElfQuest music records, ElfQuest the newspaper strip, ElfQuest novelizations. Then he turned his attention to expanding their publishing empire, and soon Warp was publishing comics by other creators besides the Peenies. Perhaps most importantly, they signed a deal with Donning Starblaze, a publisher of science fiction books, to collect early issues of ElfQuest, color them, and turn them into books to be sold in bookstores. This was a pretty radical idea. Once again, the Peenies were at the beginning of a boom, releasing their first collection just a few years after Will Eisner had largely pioneered the graphic novel with A Contract with God. But the Starblaze ElfQuest books, years before Mouse and Watchmen, were a huge hit and pivotal in opening up bookstores as a serious outlet for comics. Bookstores became ElfQuest's venue to find entire new group of readers, largely female, who love science fiction and fantasy but would have never set foot inside a comic shop. And then they got the call that was nearest and dearest to Wendy's heart. Because despite all of their success, Wendy had never stopped dreaming about seeing ElfQuest as a cartoon. And now, the animation studio Nelvana wanted to turn ElfQuest into a feature film. They optioned the rights and began development on her dream project. A decade earlier, Wendy and Richard had been among the small pool of hardcore comic fans. Now, at Comic-Con in 1981, there were almost 100 people cosplaying as elves from their comic. And they were being celebrated by the very people who inspired them. Doug Wildey gave Wendy his original drawing of Johnny Quest. Osama Tezuka became a fan and even took them out for sushi. Even Erte, the father of Art Deco and one of Wendy's early early inspirations, was photographed at 90 years old reading a German edition of ElfQuest. I believe it's hard to overstate the impact that ElfQuest had. Not only would the story and art inspire a generation of artists, but as a business, the success of ElfQuest showed creators they didn't need to work for Marvel and DC anymore, that telling their own story wouldn't consign them to poverty, but they could get as rich or richer by striking out on their own. But for Wendy and Richard, as much as things were succeeding publicly, behind the scenes, things were going off the rails. As Richard would say later, I wish I could have seen the dark clouds forming. If you've learned anything from watching my videos, you've probably learned just how hard it has been throughout history for even the most talented artists to turn their ideas into businesses without giving up control and ownership of their creations. But thanks to today's sponsor, Shopify, that's not the case anymore. If you're an artist or creator of any kind who's dreamed of turning your art into a source of income, I can't think of a better partner than Shopify. I know firsthand just how overwhelming it can be when you want to focus on your product, on your art, to also think about trying to set up an online store. 
But with Shopify's drag and drop store editor, you can quickly create a store that fits your vision, integrate it across all of your social media platforms, and get back to doing what you love. One of the reasons I started this channel was because I hope to inspire those of you out there who are artists, writers, designers, creative people of any kind to pursue a path of independence, to turn your ideas into businesses that you can own. I really encourage you to go to shopify.com slash Matt with four T's and start setting up your online store today. My primary memory of those days is of a constant feeling of betrayal. If Wendy and Richard thought that ElfQuest's success would bring them the acceptance that they had sought, they were wrong. Both of their families still viewed ElfQuest with indifference. And unlike Cerebus, there was a vocal part of comic fandom that felt that ElfQuest wasn't for real comic fans. Despite both their commercial and critical success, they were never even nominated for an Eisner Award. One of their peers blamed this on the fact that, for many members of the comic community, Wendy was still the girl who'd attended comic conventions in a chainmail bikini. But all of that was nothing compared to Wendy's health issues. She was born with hip dysplasia and was living in chronic pain, which only got worse as she drove herself to keep up with the demands of ElfQuest. By the time she was 30, she was walking with a cane. There was a newly developed surgery that might help her pain, but the punishing schedule of ElfQuest prevented her from getting it. Beyond that, their drive, their dream, their shared mission was, ironically, destroyed their marriage. They were spending so much time working that they had no time to spend as a couple. But before they could even deal with that, they had to put out fires on the business side. Once again, perhaps because of their inexperience, the business deals they'd entered into had become a source of pain. When Wendy opened the first box of Starblaze ElfQuest collections, she cried at what she saw. They had turned her beautiful black and white art into a multicolored gumball machine. As we know, the books are still a success, a testament once again to the power of ElfQuest's story, but Wendy was devastated that so many people were introduced to ElfQuest by this subpar product, and many other deals they entered into only fared worse. The newspaper strip never happened, and the VHS and album people took fans' money but never delivered a product. And then Nelvana, the animation studio, ran into trouble in their first feature film, and they decided to switch ElfQuest from animation to live action. Apparently they were planning to have child actors playing elves and riding animatronic wolves. The Peenies walked away from the deal. Wendy's dream of seeing ElfQuest in animation was dead, and soon their lives would be consumed by litigation. The Peenies would sue Starblaze over their handling of the book collections, and they would end up in a long public dispute with Colleen Duran over the ownership of the comic A Distant Soil, which she had produced for Warp. As always, I'm not going to wade too far into the specifics of litigation, but I'll put links in the show notes if you want to read more. During this period, there was one highlight. After the Nelvana deal fell apart, CBS had approached Wendy and Richard about a Saturday morning cartoon version of ElfQuest. Obviously, this was exciting to them, but once again, warning signs started to crop up that CBS wasn't going to honor their vision. They wanted to turn their dark-skinned characters white. They wanted to change characters' personalities to be more conventionally masculine or feminine. They kept shifting the target audience younger and younger. When it became clear that CBS basically wanted Muppet Babies with Elves, they realized that once again, their dream of animation was dead and walked away from the deal. Things had gotten so bad that they realized they had only two choices, either get marriage counseling or get divorced. And so, against common business wisdom, they put everything on pause. They brought that original arc of ElfQuest to a satisfying conclusion after 20 issues, and then stopped publishing. Richard handed off the other warp titles to another publisher. They began going to counseling and working on their marriage, and Wendy finally got the surgery for her hip. Eventually, they settled their legal matters and even got the rights to publish their own collections of ElfQuest. And then, they got their final revenge against Marvel for turning them down. The, the delicious irony is now that Marvel Comics will be reprinting ElfQuest in its entirety. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wonderful. That's yeah. news, I guess. The nicest thing about it of all is that we were able to tell the story start to finish, mm -hmm. all 20 issues, exactly the way we wanted to tell it. That's the way it should be done. And it's going to be reprinted exactly the way we told it. Well, They're not going to make any changes. Wendy, that's great. That's good news. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of unusual in our business, oh, too. it's a first. The comic that was too weird, too uncommercial for Marvel, became a huge hit for them and would serve as a template for how big companies and independent creators could work together. And now, after years away, they were finally ready to start publishing again. But during that time, in large part because of their influence, the comic industry had changed dramatically. 
You see, just a few months after ElfQuest ended, another quirky black and white indie comic would topple ElfQuest sales records. That comic was called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And for better or worse, those creators would make the necessary compromises to turn that property into a mainstream licensing giant. If you want the full story about that, I have a video that I'll link at the end of this one, but what's relevant right now is the profound impact that it had on the comic market. Suddenly, every publisher wanted to produce their own quirky black and white comic, and every customer wanted to buy some new black and white comic that might be the next TMNT that they could resell for 10 times what they paid. Comic shops were going mainstream, and as newsstands began to disappear, they began to make up a majority of comic sales, even for Marvel and DC. But those comic shops that had once been filled with comic lovers were beginning to be filled with comic speculators. It was in the middle of this boom and bust that Wendy and Richard re-entered the comic market. Amidst the competition, the sales of their new ElfQuest series were a fraction of what they had left with. But they stayed determined, and over the next few years consistently put out ElfQuest and saw their readership grow and grow. Quick funny aside here, after completing the second arc of ElfQuest, Wendy needed a project to recharge. She was a big fan of the show Beauty and the Beast, and so she reached out to the head writer about doing a graphic novel adaptation. That head writer turned out to be a big ElfQuest fan and helped her make that deal happen. And that head writer's name? George R.R. R. Martin. So, with the Beauty and Beast comics out, Wendy was ready to return for a third ElfQuest arc. But once again, a movie was about to come out that would dramatically change the comic landscape. I'm not going to kill you. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. In 1989, Tim Burton's Batman came out, and the impact it had on comics was profound. The boom and bust of black and white comics would be like a blip compared to what was about to happen. Batman's become hip and cool, and people can come out of the closet and admit that they read Batman and that uh, comics are in vogue now. With newsstands and spinner racks more or less gone at this point, a new generation of fans who had seen the movie flocked to comic shops for the first time, and the big companies were more than happy to play to their basest instincts, offering multiple variant covers and new number ones to entice these kids to buy multiple copies in the hopes of reselling them for a profit someday. In the months following, the gimmick and variant cover wars would only escalate. It was like the beautiful painting covers that Wendy and Richard had once made just taken to their logical conclusion. In the same month that they launched their third ElfQuest series, Marvel launched Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man number one, selling it with like six variant covers, including some in sealed poly bags, creating a buying frenzy that turned it into the best-selling comic book of all time. By comparison to all the madness ramping up, the third ElfQuest series must have stood out. ElfQuest was still quirky and still black and white, and the story was fairly somber. Wendy has said that it was a metaphor for her ongoing chronic hip pain that her multiple surgeries had failed to cure. The story revolves around loneliness, isolation, and in what would seem a prescient theme, the separation of loved ones. Perhaps because of how different it was, perhaps because the frenzy of comic store openings and comic speculation was still ramping up, the third ElfQuest series was a huge hit. While the Eisners, the mainstream acceptance by their peers, years still eluded them, sales were once again strong. This led right into the fourth ElfQuest series, which would debut within a few weeks of Image Comics' spawn number one. Image had put a brash, young face on the kind of rugged, independent publishing operation the Peenies had pioneered 14 years earlier, and they'd be rewarded with massive popularity and commercial success. This tidal wave of indie comic popularity would hit Warp as well, and they were prepared to run with it. They expanded ElfQuest from a single, thrice-yearly title to first one monthly title, then two, then three, then four. I kind of lose track at a certain point. Naturally, to produce all this, Warp had to grow. They brought in writers, pencilers, inkers, and administrators. Warp, in a way, began to resemble a mini Marvel or DC. The comic book market was booming, and they were booming right along with it. But something was missing in all of this. Wendy. While Wendy had been successful in comics, there was a dream she still had, one that had eluded her for the past decade. She wanted to see ElfQuest in animation. And so, in 1994, when the producer Ed Pressman optioned ElfQuest, Wendy made a very difficult choice. She decided to move to California, leaving Richard and the comics behind to finally get her movie made. While she would still contribute to ElfQuest, including a few beautiful painted issues, her involvement was dwindling. Sometimes she and Richard would plot, sometimes she would script, rarely would she do the art. Many of these comics are still really good, but ElfQuest was so personal to Wendy's artistic vision, to exploring Wendy and Richard's lives through metaphor, that without Wendy, these comics sometimes lack the profound weightiness of the earlier series. I think this must have been hard for those around her to understand, because she appears in an issue of ElfQuest in a dream to explain herself. Richard's stand-in, Skywise, asks her, what's better than devoting your whole life to us? Wendy answers, don't you know I'm on a quest to tell your story in a way that'll reach millions more people than ever? I've uprooted my whole life for you. My life mates far, far away. That's crazy, Cutter says. How can you stand it? When will you be together again? 
Wendy answers, when your story is written across the sky in thunder and sky fire, when no corner of my world doesn't know about you. I'm human, I have big dreams and goals, but that means making sacrifices. After Wendy departs, Cutter wonders, when her quest is done, when she returns to her roots to finish our story, how deep will she be willing to go then? This is a reference to a story called The Final Quest. You see, Wendy and Richard already knew how they wanted ElfQuest to end. Wendy had even drawn the final page. But for now, The Final Quest would have to wait. Because this movie was her dream. She was willing to put both her marriage and her hit comic on the line to make it happen. She was turning in hundreds of pages of storyboards for Pressman, fully consumed with bringing the ElfQuest movie to life. But that meant Richard was alone in New York as the comic industry faced its biggest upheaval yet. Once again, I'm going to summarize and recommend you check out Dan Giorino's comic shop if you want the full story. But like all good speculator booms, the comic book bubble was bursting. The first domino was that a lot of these new, popular independent publishers were not shipping comics on time. That maybe shouldn't have been a big deal, but remember that key feature of the direct market that retailers prepaid for non-returnable books? Well, imagine what happens when you, as the retailer, prepay for a ton of copies of a hot new book that is two or three months late. You're a small shop without a lot of cash, and now you're out all the money you spent while you wait and wait to finally get a product you can sell and make back your investment. But at the same time, demand was cooling off. It was becoming clear to all these speculators that no one was ever going to come along and pay exorbitant prices to make them rich. So when your shop finally gets its huge order of comics in, there's no one around to buy them. Individual comic shops, small businesses were left holding boxes and boxes of comics that no one was ever going to buy. Stores began to close left and right. As shops closed, small publishers like Warp, who didn't have big marketing budgets, lost their only means to reach their customers. Between shop closings and the bitterness of comic fans who'd been told they were going to strike it rich, sales declined across the industry. Warp fought on, but then the store closings began causing the distributors to die off. This hit Warp even harder because distributors who owed Warp thousands of dollars went bankrupt without paying their bills. But still, Warp fought on. But remember, a big portion of Warp's business was in bookstores. And bookstores are a returnable business. And so, just as all of this is happening, the shrinking demand for comics meant that bookstores were returning books to Warp by the box load and expecting prompt refunds. It was too much to bear. Richard was forced to lay off their entire staff. He canceled all the ElfQuest comics and refinanced the house so that they could pay their debts. And in California, things hadn't gone much better for Wendy. After years of work, hundreds of storyboards, round after round of script revision, it was clear that Wendy and Pressman had different visions for ElfQuest. Well, they had gone with Pressman because he had successfully made dark, authentic comic adaptations like Conan and the Crow. His true plan for ElfQuest was to make a movie for his five-year-old son. After years of work, years away from her husband and her comic, she decided to walk away from the deal. The ElfQuest movie was dead. Their comic publishing business had imploded. Normal, rational people would file for bankruptcy and move on with their lives. But Wendy and Richard Peeney are not normal, rational people. In most stories, this would be the part where I tell you about how the Peenies fought tooth and nail to get their movie made. How it tore apart their marriage, but it was worth it in the end. But this isn't that kind of story. So instead, I'll read you this quote from Wendy. For the first time, people became more important to me than ElfQuest. If the movie never got made, I could live with that. But I'd never again be able to live without my friends. Life was teaching Wendy and Richard a new lesson. You see, that time apart not only didn't hurt their marriage, but possibly saved it. There's a mirror here with their early lives as cross-country pen pals. They would travel back and forth to see each other, and it rekindled their love. They were learning the lesson of letting go. This was the next stage of the acceptance Wendy had been looking for all along. The acceptance of the way things are. And so, they paid their writers and artists as freelancers to wrap up their stories and began looking for someone else to take over publishing. Ironically, they found that partner in DC Comics. Richard had returned to his original mission. He didn't need to take over the publishing world, he just needed to keep ElfQuest in print. He needed to facilitate ElfQuest's story being told. Wendy and Richard even got to produce some new issues of ElfQuest for DC, just the two of them the way they used to. Of course, DC didn't make any progress on a movie, and after that relationship ended, Warner optioned ElfQuest. But Warner's option came with an interesting stipulation. They weren't allowed to publish any new ElfQuest material during the four-year term. But this, in its own way, led to the most radical act of letting go yet. 
because while Wendy used this time to explore side projects to delve deeper into the world of digital art, Richard was once again watching a revolution in comic publishing. This time, it was a digital revolution. It was 2009 and the big companies had begun selling comics online. Maybe a past version of Richard would have jumped at the opportunity to find a new way to monetize their back catalog, but this was the Richard who had learned the art of letting go. And so, over the next year and a half, Richard would physically scan every page of every ElfQuest comic ever published and put them all up online for free. This was it, the embodiment of his mission, of his love for Wendy. It didn't matter if they made money. In fact, they were gonna lose a tremendous amount of money on web hosting, but the world needed to see her art. The world needed to read their story and nothing else mattered. And the letting go didn't stop there. They donated their entire collection of original artwork to the Columbia University Library. If you've ever seen what original comic art sells for, it's easy to imagine that this was hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of artwork that they just gave away. And now anyone can go to Columbia and see Wendy's original artwork. I think all of this letting go, this generosity of spirit, kept the flame burning for ElfQuest through these challenging times and opened the door for the next chapter of their story. In 2012, they were approached by Dark Horse Comics. Dark Horse had grown out of the black and white comic boom that ElfQuest had helped start. They'd survived the ups and downs of the comic industry and become a major comic publisher. And they had a question. Do you guys have any ideas for a new ElfQuest comic? I can just picture Wendy and Richard looking at each other in that moment, smiling knowingly. The time had finally come for their final quest. First, Dark Horse brought out these beautiful black and white collections of the entirety of ElfQuest. They're so true to Richard's vision. Big, readable, affordable volumes. But of course, you can still read the whole thing online for free. Then, with the Warner option expired, Wendy and Richard began the conclusion to their journey the same way they started it. Going on long drives to work out the plot, arguing character developments over a pizza, pouring the ups and downs of their lives, of their innermost thoughts onto every page. The final quest is a fascinating read. It's a bittersweet book, as the elves wrestle with difficult questions. Characters feel the weight of their years, and they deal openly with the impending end of their lives. They struggle as they're forced to choose between their dreams and the people they love. Some relationships end, others evolve, and new life begins. It's not what every fan expected, but it feels so appropriate, so truthful to the spirit of ElfQuest. And so, in 2018, exactly 40 years to the day after ElfQuest first appeared, the final issue of The Final Quest brought their grand journey to a close. The very next year, ElfQuest finally won its first Eisner Award. The lesson has been patience. For a long, long time, we have thought ElfQuest needs to be an animated film or a series or a cartoon or whatever. It doesn't need to be anything than what it is. When I look back on various opportunities that we had that felt through, I also look at what might have happened if it hadn't fallen through. And we would have been stopped in our tracks. It's going to happen. I am now calm about it, whatever happens. So I think I learned the lesson of patience and the reward of patience is patience. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you can really help out by liking, subscribing, commenting, or sharing it with a friend or on social media. If you want to go deeper into the Peenies story or you've just fallen in love with Wendy's art, I strongly, strongly recommend Line of Beauty, The Art of Wendy Peeny. I'll put links for everything down below. A big thank you, of course, to the Peenies, who spent hours and hours answering my questions. We talked about so much stuff, and I wasn't able to fit it all into this video, so I hope to upload those interviews somewhere, maybe to a Patreon or a second channel at some point. Finally, thanks to you guys for watching and supporting me over the past 11 months. It's because of your support that I've been able to book interviews with people like the Peenies, and I hope that as this channel grows, I can use it as a platform to do more interviews and deeper research and bring you guys better videos. Thanks again, and I'll see you soon.